I'm flying out here in an hour. And so I just want to let you guys know um, I won't be on the CCC table later today. So bless oh. you guys. Have a good one. All right. So I, I wanted to say, I think uh, uh, the commitment, we need to kind of be a little clearer on how people join and, uh, and the process of joining us to be a little firmer. Uh, so we know where people are uh, in terms of uh, somebody wants to join and they get to somehow fill a form. And I think that's, that process makes a big difference in terms of how you join an organization. So you, you get to fill a form and you get to uh, say, I'm doing the I mean $100 a month uh, level or I'm doing the other commitment. So at least on paper, we know where people are and you know that's a commitment they made. And I think uh, we, we need a process obviously of accountability uh, like Christina said, and uh, and I think that has to be a monthly thing. I mean, I don't think it, I, I don't think quarterly will work. I think monthly uh, will be a process. I mean, it could simply be an email, an, an email invoice, or something that goes to people. Uh, you know, hey, we haven't received. Uh, you know, this is your bill for the month. Uh, we want them to do it automatic anyway, so I think that would be the easiest way. So this is you know, and they get a thank you note for supporting CCC. Um, being a very, very good member. And if there's something missing, somebody from the trustee can reach out. Uh, if somebody consistently <clears throat> haven't, you know, haven't been to find out what's going on with them and they have a problem, uh, is there any challenge? Because, you know, so I think there has to be that process on the back end. Uh, I think when we leave something just, you know, open-ended, they tend to not, people tend to, I mean, people want accountability or need accountability to do even the basic things that we ask them to do. Yeah. So that form think, does, uh, that may, form may exists. I, yeah. That form exists, Joe. Um, the, the, the form that he's talking about does exist. There's an application yeah. process. All these yeah. things exist. I, I think the, um, it's more about maybe, I think maybe what might be wise, Joe, is I put something in place that shows every single thing that CC does, CCC does for the entire year. Um, maybe we take that and then um, let everybody review it. And if something in that, in that year resonates with someone, maybe someone can take it over. We did this once before, Joe, and it worked really well. And then someone can say, you know what, Chris, I, I read this and I'd like to do this. I you know, this is, I'll take it over. And then when that person takes it over, then at least Christina Mitchell knows who she's working with specifically on specific things that happen throughout the year. And I have that already in place, Joe. So if you just get me everybody's emails, I'd be happy to send it to everybody. Okay. This is very good. I think that would be a great uh, to sustain, yeah. but I think a uh, verbal presentation should take place um, and maybe an, an, a table that we are gonna be putting together uh, where the trustees, uh, I'm, I'm willing to do that myself, Mike and Jody and maybe Ray together, make a, a verbal presentation, um, take 10 minutes maybe out of the table the next table, maybe not next week, but some other time that sure you could pick, we could explain everything to them, to everybody, and say, you know, that um, uh, welcome anyone that want to be part, uh, a covenant partner. Uh, there's those that could show up on Thursday morning just to watch, but those that want to be a covenant partners, there is formal membership. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, now that I'm hearing all this, as a trustee, um, I cannot, like, I appreciate about the network, the network of my pastors. I will be starting approaching them about receiving an offering once a year, but then I do have uh, affiliation with other networks and other leaders, like one of them, uh, two of them right now that, that's going with us to Lebanon. And they're very, very, very powerful, wonderful apostles. Now I could really approach these people and invite them to come and after, you know, uh, formal application, we could vote on the approve them, and we could widen the circle with some really uh, like mind, like kind leaders who would be able to bring in uh, finances and and uh, values. Mm -hmm. Excellent, that's great. No, I know uh, no, I that. Oh, uh, go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say, Joe, that um, in addition to what Christine and others have said, I think it would be good if we 
I don't know how you do that, but as part of processes, it would really be helpful if you had just maybe like an automatic deduction every month. Uh, I think it takes a lot of the the tension and the angst and the all of the little things that you know people trying to remember and people making it a priority. It's just hey, listen, you've committed uh, just a hundred dollars is going to come out of your credit card a month. We give you that permission. You can select that feature. Um, you know, when you join, and that to me should should be should be sufficient, uh, mm-hmm. and that keeps you know that keeps this lapse from from happening. You know, we can you know kind of close that door right away with that feature. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have that feature actually. That feature does exist, Ray. Um, um, Frank set that up. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah no, we no, have it, it on the website. Actually, uh, GD, because of my relationship with them, I bypassed you to go through the formal process. I think I remember telling you, but yeah, in order for someone to join, they have to download the application, fill it out, submit it to us. Um, and uh, they, they're supposed to pick one of the three levels that they're going to join, especially membership or covenant partner, covenant partners, when they're looking to us for covering and 5% of their tied. Uh, well, 50% of their personal tithe or 5% of their personal income, whichever way you want to look at it. And um, yeah, so we already have that. And we did have letters going out regularly. Um, and we, I, Christina already has all that. So we could, uh, Christina Hosh can work with Christina to get that going again. Um, but uh Yeah. Yeah, all this, we were okay. very, very systematic at one time. We got a little sloppy before, right before COVID or right because of COVID. But we did have a lot of these systems. So we, were, we already have all the material. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah, a lot of people do give automatically. Uh, some people actually cut automatic checks, like Raful sends checks. But most people are doing it um, through online giving. Uh, I think that's how it's going. Okay. But I definitely need help with calling potential members. There's like 10 potential members, low hanging fruit. Uh, we could just rope in and just need help with that. I just don't have the time. So if anybody wants to help with that, please let me know. Well, I think uh, uh, I think Pastor Rafu says something about presentation. I think that's that's necessary. I think we need a we need to kind of have like a big meeting. Uh, I think you might actually push for that in terms of uh, making sure we have a meeting uh, that is special uh, that you're gonna mm-hmm. reach out to people to attend. Uh, a good meeting where we try to get a good attendance. Uh, so at least everybody's reach out to and at that meeting, there will be a presentation, uh, a presentation about, you know, uh, CCC, what it does, how we operate, uh, you know, what great benefit it is and the different levels of membership that we want people to commit to be members. That's what makes it work. That's what makes it uh, fruitful. Uh, that's what makes the organization really strong. Uh, so it can be there, not just for now and for the future. Uh, and we make a case for membership. Uh, and you know, if you know people who have been members, uh, we encourage them. And people who have uh, been members but they are not, you know, uh, faithful in terms of their financial commitment, we make a case for that. And we also make it for new members. And we put a link there for people to. If we can make the application electronics, I think that would be good. Uh, something that people can fill out and they indicate, at least the new people, they indicate uh, uh, you know, what level of membership do they want? Do they just want to be members or they want to be covenant partners? Um, you know, I think we can make it clearer. Uh, you know, I think we need a meeting where we talk about that, uh, at least to start with, kind of like a you know, some big meeting where that is presented. Uh, that's kind of the focus. Uh, and I think maybe one, every once in a while, somebody kind of, you know, just talk about the membership aspect as well. These are brilliant so, ideas. So, 
Yeah, and so just so that you know, we do have a welcoming protocol in place already. Like so I there, know. You know, a lot of, yeah. So I think, so what makes it a little difficult with CCC is because it is so um, relational and, you know, intimate in that setting, sometimes meetings take away from that. So usually the better way, because in that meeting, you may have 10 people, but Joe may not approve those 10 people. And right. so it, 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 I think it's a, it, it, I'm not quite sure if that format would work specifically with CCC because it may lead to disappointment. Okay. I think maybe the implement, we already have a welcoming protocol that is a lot more intimate, actually, and a lot, I think, make, makes the people recognize that, you know, this is just, you're, there's no guarantee you're going to be accepted, you know, so I think what is in place right now actually has worked quite well because people get very one-on-one -on -one attention. The, 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 the welcoming protocol and criteria right now is an application process. It goes directly to Joe. Joe reviews it. After Joe reviews it, he'll make an executive decision for the first round of, you know what, I'm, I, he's, they've met the criteria. Then he brings it to the trustees, at which point there's a, there's a decision made. Now, if that person is, you know, invited in, then there is a protocol in place, which opens up a dialogue one on one with that individual to let them know what's expected and what they're committed to. So maybe we should just revisit some of the things that already exist. And then when we see what's already existing, maybe remove or, you know, change a few things according to where we are right now with the new members, because everybody has like a something that they can offer and maybe new ideas on how to kind of elevate it to the next level. So I, I think, Joe, if you give me, I'll put together everything, you know, a package of the welcome, package of the criteria, I'll, I'll let everybody know what we do. And then why don't you just give some, everybody that, you know, some time to look at it and just make recommendations on how we could just elevate it to the next level instead of starting from scratch, because we're not starting from scratch. I think we have a really good model in place. I think the challenges that we have is who can in accountability with the model. That seems to be the hardest thing right now because Joe is so busy. So again, I think the, be the better thing to do right now is to look at this model and assign people to certain things. Because once you're assigned to it, then I know Christina Mitchell and myself and Joe can, can keep people accountable. We've done that in the past. And when they're not accountable, we also have a timeline in place that, that Joe can remove them. So after a year of doing things, there's something in place saying that if you have not committed to what you're doing at the end of the year, he can remove you from that position. So why don't we, well, you know, let me send everything off to everybody. I think that's a great first step, Joe. And then let everybody kind of look at it and then – you know, give their recommendations. That's so if you guys could email Christina, Christina, give your email address so they could all copy it. And then Christina, sure. so it's, email you. yeah, so it's Christina Hosh, H O S C H. That's my name. My phone number is 646 430 1754. 646 430 1754. Um, my email is Chrislyn, K-R-I-S-L-E-N, K-R-I-S-L-E-N, management, abbreviated, M-G-M-T, C-O-R-P, at AOL.com. Chrislyn Management Corp. at AOL.com. And if I'm, anybody just texts me right now, I'll send it to you. So, like, if you just yeah, I'm gonna, quickly I put my the best. So, can you repeat your phone number? Sure. It's 646-430-1754. Text me your name, and then I'll just store your name, and I'll send you my email. And it'll be a just – I'll set up a call with you. I have no problem with that. I'll set up a call. We'll take a few minutes, and – I, I think that it'll you, you'll you're gonna be quickly impressed with everything we've done and up until this point. It all exists. I think it's just a matter of revamping things, changing things, elevating things, and just putting people in new positions right now. I think once we do this, you'll all see like wow, like 
it, it already the model exists everything exists we spent a lot of time doing this correctly and we could just take it from this point and launch it in a completely different direction we're not starting from scratch gentlemen okay. can we uh plan another trustee meeting september 30th before the table so we could go over everything with assimilation and and plan out the next step after you guys review what Christina sends? Yes. What what date is the 30th, Joe? Uh, it's a what Thursday, date? September okay, 30th, fine. and we'd meet at 9 a.m. before the table. Yeah, that's that'll fine. Be a, that'll be a week after we come back from Lebanon. All right, that's good for me, Joe. And uh, with that, I've got to I've got to jump off the call. I'll jump back on in about 20 minutes, but uh, I gotta I gotta get off the call. But yeah, since September 30th should be fine. Okay, I have it in, in here and uh, appreciate all of you. We have to start letting people in. Uh, and one other thing I'll say is this Lebanon trip is gonna take CCT to another level. We've never done apostolic trips before and we may need to, um, We I think that's gonna bring a more a greater attraction because there's not too many movements that are doing apostolic teams together. And this is going to blow up. I think we're going to do other trips to the Middle East. We may need to uh, assign an international director of CCC. At least Raful could represent CCC to the whole Middle East, like maybe be an international director for CCC to the Middle East. And, um, you know, uh, we'll probably be doing a lot of other trips. So, um, you know, let's, uh, let's have another meeting September 30th. And... Um, yeah, I'm excited over the direction. I, I feel very good about CCC. I tell you, I'm Amen. really excited about it. I think it's upside is it's more in line with my DNA covenant relationship and apostolic. Okay. We have about 20, 15 people want to get in. I better let them in now. Thank you all. So, all right. Bye-bye. Don't forget take to care, everyone. Take me. Oh, all right. Take care. Of Joe. Bye, Joe. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, okay, good to see everybody. Um, let me make Victor co-host. Oh, made the wrong person co-host. Hold on a second. All right. Okay, good to see everybody is joining us. I hope you're still born again, still married. If you're married and you're still, obviously you're still breathing. So that's all a good sign. I put my pants on right this morning, as Mark Esty said. So we're doing good. Let me get, get the recording going here. All right. So today we're going to continue our discussion on biblical translations, contemporary translations of the Bible. And uh, we just had an amazing conversation last week with uh, biblical scholar Matthew Barron, who's an associate pastor with Steve Trujillo. And um, by the way, we want to keep Steve in prayer because he's going through uh, brain um, treatments every day. So at the end of this Jesus. broadcast we're going to just pray for him and uh i love his family i love his church and i feel like they're part of my family and uh you know we want to stand with them okay as a matter of fact let's pray right now um let's pray right now um elliot lead us in prayer for steve yes, yes he's got yes. he's got uh they had they found a tumor in his brain but it was lodged in a spot where they couldn't get the whole thing out. Jesus. And uh, I'm not even sure if it's cancerous. I think it is. Is it Matthew? Uh, I'm not exactly sure the the exact nature of it. I do know it is a tumor. I don't think it's benign. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's cancerous, but they couldn't get all of it because it was in a dangerous spot. So he yeah. could have been paralyzed. So, 
uh, the, the little bit that's left, they, they're going through, you know, he's going through treatments. He can't get on these calls because he's getting treatments around this time. A lot of dizziness, um, uh, a lot of, you know, being, uh, you know, throwing up that kind of thing. And it's every day he's getting the treatments. It's very aggressive. Um, and he was a trooper. I was out there a few weeks. He still led the meetings, the pastor's mm -hmm. meetings. He's trying his hardest. I had dinner with him and his wife and his son, and I just love that family. So just uh, keep them in prayer, even when this meeting is not going on. Steve Trujillo, he's got a tremendous influence in the city of Portland, and the church is just amazing. So, Elliot, just lead us in prayer, please, right now. Father, we thank you that you are the God of miracles. We thank you that you changed not. You were the same yesterday and today, today, oh God, and you would be the same tomorrow. We bring Steve before you right now in your wonderful name. We thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who heals us of all our diseases. So we pray for Steve right now. Every cell, every organ, every system in his body to be cleansed of every abnormality, every, every disease and sickness right now. We call forth for your healing power to be activated in his life, oh God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, by your stripes, he is healed. He is healed. He is healed. Lord, we just pray, Lord God, for the doctor. We thank you for doctors, the medical profession, give them the wisdom that they need, give them the insight right now, Father, for all they are doing for him right now. Just guide them right now in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, for Steve, Lord God, for his faith shall not fail right now. And in his meantime, in this ugly season of his life, that he will trust you, Lord God, with his life. We pray for his household and his family and his church, Lord God, as they come together, as we wait on you for the miracle work and power of your presence, oh God, to be established in him and through him, oh God. And we rejoice on this side to say that he is the healed of the Lord. He is the healed of the Lord. So we pray for complete restoration for him, Lord, that he will resume, Lord God, the call of God upon his life, and he can say and stand tall and say, look what the Lord has done. Great is his faithfulness, for God is still a healer. Jehovah Rapha, we just glorify you this day, and we thank you as we come together, one mind and one accord, to come to your throne of grace and bring Steve before you. And in this time of need, Lord God, he received grace and mercy and healing in Christ's name, in Christ's name. Amen. We give you all honor. We give you all glory and we give you all praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, so please keep Steve Trujillo in prayer, especially during this time when he's getting daily treatments. Okay. So last week we began a discussion with biblical scholar, Matthew Barron. We covered uh, the King James only controversy we covered the uh, critique of the Passion Bible, so we're not going to repeat that. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to ask him a few questions about some of the other modern translations. Then the rest of the meeting, we're going to have Q&A. So if you have questions about anything related to the Passion Bible or the King James only controversy, it's, it's on the table. But before we get to that, uh, thank you, Matthew, for not only being on the table last week and today, but you're part of our table now. So we're excited to have you. Um, and, uh, and so if I paraphrase a Bible and say it's a real thing, then he's going to correct me. So and correct all of you. Right. So we need that. But anyway, I, I call it the Joe Matera version of the Bible sometimes when I'm preaching. You know, you, you could quote or misquote scripture, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, Matthew, um, so thank you again for that book. Can you raise the book up again? Show everybody I can't recommend this enough. This is an incredible book. I highly recommend it being on the shelf. Even if you don't read the whole thing now, you might need it as a tool if someone asked you about one of the major translations of the Bible. And uh I just love it. I love this kind of stuff. So I basically read almost the whole book within two days, but uh, still got more to read. So thank you for writing that book, for putting all the time in and for doing it without getting academic um, credentials for it. You know, you could have done that for a, a, a PhD or a 
masters and you didn't and you just did it for the body of christ and i thank god for that so anyway going uh back to the translations um i this is what i do and i don't know if you would resonate with any of this but my favorite translation of the bible generally is the new american standard version of the bible uh i use the 1995 version that doesn't have the these and thous I like it the best because I find it has a very meaty substance, uh, very accurate word for word. um, And it's almost as meaty or poetic as the King James version, but it's more up to date. And so I read that at times for serious study. Uh, When I'm reading something historically like uh, the, you know, book of judges or, First Kings, Second Kings, Chronicles, the book of Acts, especially the book of Acts. I love the NIV because it's uh, more sentence by sentence equivalency. They're more concerned with context, which means that if you're trying to understand the context of a book, in my opinion, read the NIV first, read the whole book first, fast, and then go back and do word for word study, let's say with the NASB or another translation. So that's what I do with the NIV. And the other thing, truth be told, sometimes my brain is fried and I don't want to deal with big words. And um, not that the NIV isn't good for word for word uh, study, but uh, when I just want to know the story and the narrative and I don't, you know, I, I don't have a lot of mental energy. I just love the NIV. It's just so much fun to read the NIV because it's not a paraphrase. It's very potent, powerful but it's not as word for word um, in, uh, in its intent as some of the others. So I love the NASB. That's my favorite. I love the NIV for context and narrative. Uh, I love the ESV. The ESV is, to me, uh, I, I'm not trying to be scholarly, but it seems like a cross between the NASB and the NIV. It's, it's sort of like easier flow contextually then the NASB, but it's not sentence by sentence like the NIV. So I love the ESV. I use that a lot in preaching. Um, And the New King James is what I like to preach from because my first 10, 15 years, I actually only read the King James, preach from it. And if I preach from the ESV or NASB, I kind of get thrown off. And so the New King James version I use for preaching uh, so it doesn't throw me off. And I love that because all the footnotes. So you might've got into that last week, but so what do you think of what I'm saying? What do you think of the NASB as a translation? I think your three characterizations of the NASB, NIV, ESV are pretty good ones. Although I would, I'd, I'll go into a little bit of the history of each of it, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, the NASB, New American Standard Bible, uh, from the outset was a translation really intended for discipleship. Um, it was produced by the Lockman Foundation. Uh, uh, Mr. Lockman, with his uh, Orange Grove down in California, sold a lot of his uh, property to finance the publication of this New American Standard Bible. It was started out in late 50s, early 60s. Now, um, they, they, they are, had already been publishing discipleship material, uh, evangelistic materials, and they're like, well, we really need to have a translation that uh, will help people really dig into the scripture more. Um, and the, the thing about the New American Standard Bible is that it's what, what's called more word for word. It's more formal. And I make a distinction between uh, formal and literal. Uh, when I say formal... I mean that the text, you can kind of maps over the Hebrew and the Greek words uh, a little bit better. And so that the grammar is more consistent, uh, more consistently reflects the Hebrew and Greek forms. Literal, uh, as the way I interpret it in my book, at least, as I literal is um, where you take a figurative figure of speech and you kind of give the literal explanation of what that means. So for instance, if Jesus calls out, you know, you vipers, a literal interpretation would be, uh, you spew terrible words, you know, that'd be kind of a literal interpretation. A formal translation would keep the word viper because that's the one that's actually in, in the text. 
the way that the New American Standard Bible uses the word literal in its footnotes is the formal way of, of rendering the text. So sometimes you'll go through the New American Standard Bible, and it, it's, as I said, it, it maps the Hebrew and the Greek forms uh, pretty consistently, uh, and it's pretty concordant. That means when it shows up uh, a Hebrew word or a Greek word, it'll try to render as consistently as possible that Hebrew or Greek word. So it's really ideal for word studies, for thematic studies as well. You, you're, you're reading through the uh, New American Standard Bible, you come across a word in one passage, you come across the same, uh, same word in another passage, and you immediately can say, oh, I made that association with the previous passage. I wonder if there's something there. Usually there is. Usually it's the same uh, word or the same word group. Um, so, yeah, the New American Standard Bible, I'd say, is a family of translations because there are still uh, earlier editions published. Um, the 1977 edition, as uh, Brother Matera said, is exactly right. It comes out the these and the thous, and it carries that on from the American Standard Version tradition, except it does something unique. It actually follows the re Revised Standard Version with the these and the thous. It doesn't use the these and thous for singular you consistently. It uses the these and thous specifically in uh, when it's talking to God in prayer. So it's kind of inconsistent in that sense. The New American Standard Bible 1995 update uh, does away with the these and thous and goes with typical English usage. Um, so you have to gather the... Uh, this the use of you have to gather the use from the context of for the singular use there are a couple new developments with the new american standard bible uh the 2020 update or i should say the 2020 edition they don't call it the update anymore uh the, it's the 95 edition and the 2020 edition and the 2020 edition um They've updated the, the language, the wording, to can be more consistent with English usage. Uh, they've, there's some places that were rendered pretty woodenly uh, in the 95 update that the 2020 edition has smoothed over a little bit, particularly Isaiah chapter 53. They've, they've cleaned that one up to read much, more, much better, so it'll preach better on your pulpit. But the added benefit of the 2020 edition is they've gone through and they've updated some of the lexical uh, entry, some of the vocabulary, not just to be consistent with English usage, but also to be more precise and more accurate with the Hebrew and the Greek. So I, I say kudos to the 2020 edition. If you want to get a new uh, translation of, in the New American Standard family, I, the 2020 is a good one to go. I think it'll preach better than your 95 edition. There's also another translation, I shouldn't say translation, another edition in the New American Standard family uh, called the Legacy Standard Bible. This is uh, at the instigation of uh, John MacArthur's ministry, uh, Grace Bible or Grace, Grace Church, whatever the name of uh, that church is again. But uh, the Legacy Standard Bible is in the tradition of the New American Standard Bible. It's actually copyright owned by Lockman Foundation. And it uh, purports to be a very formal, very formal, more formal than the 90, 1977 edition, more formal than the 1995 update. Uh, and it truly is. If you want something that, that to study word for word, if you want something to really help you with your thematic study, the Legacy Standard Bible is probably the most formal, the most readable and formal edition available on the market today. Uh, it's not complete yet. It will be completed here uh, very soon. I don't remember the exact final publish, publication time timeline, but the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs are available now. Wow. Um, so will it read as rigid as the original American standard? Uh, American standard would have been the most accurate. Some people still say it's the most accurate, but it didn't have the... Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls available and other manuscript, but it was very wooden. Uh, the American Standard, I have one of those too. So is it as wooden or as formal as the American Standard? No, it is not as formal as the American Standard version. And okay. What, the, what, the, what, they call, what the Lockman Foundation calls the rock of, of biblical accuracy. That was the, they took the American Standard as their model uh, initially, but the, they moved on from there. Yeah, I mean, 
I guess, give a brief history of uh, the revised standard uh, in the 19th century. And then the American standard was more the conservative version of the revised standard. And then uh, we have the new American standard uh, based on the American standard. And then we have the new revised standard that now we have the ESV that's an evangelical version of the new revised standard. So can you explain all this, please? So yeah, going all the way back to the late 1800s, um, there was uh, uh, advances in textual criticism because you know between the the 400 some odd years between the publication of the original King James in 1611 to the, uh, the revised version of 18 of the 1880s, there were a lot of textual discoveries. You had guys like uh, Constantin von Tischendorf discover the. Uh, or I should say rediscover the Codex Sinaiticus in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, you had um, the Oxyrhynchus papyri discoveries down in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, and these are manuscripts that predate anything that the King James translators had. And so there were new theories as to how the, the text of the New Testament was transmitted from one generation to the next. And the, the textual critics produced a new text basis. Granted, when I say new text basis, we're talking about maybe, maybe uh, actually the less than 4% difference between uh, the King James text basis and the, the modern uh, critical editions of the Greek New Testament. So um, they decided, well, now's the opportunity to revise the King James version. There had been attempts before that were uh, canceled. Parliament in the, in the 1650s tried and, and failed. You had the, the rump parliament couldn't, couldn't carry, the, carry the vote to revise the King James Version. So in the um, eight, late 1880s, you had uh, a production of the revised version, which was a, it was actually a British and American a cooperation. Um, and it was intended to be the, the, the standard the Bible in the, in, the, in the UK and Britain and, and well, throughout the British Empire. The US uh, team gave their recommendations, gave their uh, uh, suggestions, but they were not actually included in the revised version. And they were, though they were appended at the end to say, hey, these are the American team's recommendations and suggestions. Uh, it took another 14 years after the publication of the revised version. Uh, 1901 is when the uh, American Standard Version was permitted to publish the, uh, their, their edition with all their recommendations, excluding the Apocrypha, keeping in mind that the revised version being an Anglican production, uh, I should say a generally uh, Anglican production also included the Apocrypha. The American Standard Version did not include the Apocrypha. And so they, 14 years after the revised version was published, the American, St American uh, Standard uh, Version Committee was able to publish their American version that became the, the ASB and became the basis for uh, a lot of, uh, I should say several English translations today, it became the basis for the new American Standard, became the basis for the revised standard and the revised standard became the basis for the new revised standard version and the English standard version. The revised standard version, which was the successor of the American standard version, was published in 1946 for the New Testament, 1952 for the Old Testament. It, uh, it really uh, it strove to update the language and produce it in the language that, uh, that people could uh, understand from the pulpit, not just in, the, in those who had grown up with the King James Version. It was uh, good for, uh, much better for evangelism. The problem with the Revised Standard Version was, for most conservatives was that the people who produced the Revised Standard Version were not, did not have any evangelical commitments. It was an ecumenical translation pr uh, produced by the National Council of Churches of, of Christ in the USA, an ecumenical uh, assembly. And there were concerns that the, the, the translators didn't have that same evangelical commitment, even though there were a lot of evangelicals on the translation team. And so there were concerns with the text basis there where they said, you know, you had uh, 
you had, let's say Isaiah chapter uh, seven, verse 14, where it says, um, it says that a, not a virgin will bear a child, which we know as a, a Christological prophecy, but it says a young woman, which is a young woman that will produce a child. And so all of a sudden, oh no, there are, people are attacking our, 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 the Christian basis of the Old Testament is what the, the attacks or the assumptions were. Um, granted, the Hebrew does allow for, for that rendering, but you had a reaction because that was kind of a pet verse at the time. Um, and so from in 1952, you had uh, conservatives approaching the National Council of Churches saying, hey, we want a conservative edition of this. We want this one rendered in a way that is acceptable to uh, the evangel the conservative evangelicals. And the NCC, National Council of Churches, said, eh, no. Had they permitted that, there probably would have never been a need for the new international version. And so in the 19, late 50s, actually, there was a, 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 um, a, a engineer from Seattle who came down to Portland, uh, where I live in Portland, Oregon, went to a, a hotel there, started evangelizing uh, one of his, uh, his neighbors, one of his, uh, another, another engineer, and invited him up to his hotel room and going to share the gospel through the scripture itself and he grabbed what was available a Gideon's Bible and the guy he was evangelizing the guy he was he's taking through the scriptures all of a sudden just broke up laughing it was like that's the funniest thing I've ever heard why because the Gideon's Bible use, was using the King James Version Jacobean Elizabethan English and so it short-circuited his ability to to share the gospel in, with that strategy um and he's like, there's got to, there's got to have, we've got to have a modern translation in a language that people can understand. And he was the instigator for the new international version. Um, he, he strove to see that one realized. He encouraged it. He estimated what its cost what it might be. And uh, through his church, uh, Presbyterian church, they approached uh, the synods and kind of find out there was another synod that was also looking for the same kind of uh, a Bible translation, and so the two melded together, worked together, and then they started they started snowballing. And by the '60s, you had a, 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 a genuine effort to produce the new international version as an evangelistic tool. Um, and they yeah, they had gathered a committee of Bible translators, uh, a committee of 15 members who uh, still exist. That committee still exists, even though the members have changed. Who perpetuate the NIV today? Um, but there was in 1996 an edition of the new international version that caught attention in the UK the Americans across the pond were looking at this edition it was a inclusive language edition and I think the the decisions were generally justified but it caused concerns because you had uh, the, the rise of the gender debates in the mid-90s you had uh, even even the focus on the family. James Dobson got got caught up in this with the and he produced he gathered uh, signers together to produce what was called the Colorado Springs Guidelines, uh, which detailed what the inclusive language lang uh, should look like and how it should be rendered in the New Testament. And this was a reaction to the New International Version's uh, inclusive language edition that never never really caught on. In the U.S., it was uh, alive and active in the U.K., United Kingdom, for a short while. Um, and eventually, got uh, the, some of the decisions got uh, blended into today's New International Version or the New National Reader's Version, and those later influenced the uh, New International Version 2011 edition. But right around there, 1997 was when the uh, the Colorado Springs guidelines on gender translation rendering uh, was produced. That's about right around that time, you had a guys at Crossway Publishers, you had Wayne Grudem saying, hey, we need to have a conservative rendering of the Revised Standard Version, the thing that, they, that evangelicals wanted in the 50s. So, he, But uh, Wayne Grudem and the president of the Crossway got the permission, got the license uh, to, to do a revision of the Revised Standard Version, and that became our English Standard Version in 2001. And they uh, have a, a committee of Bible translators as well that also maintains a translation to this day.
The ESV, the, the quality of the nature of the English Standard Version, it comes from the, the King James, uh, Tyndale King James Version tradition the, via the revised version of, of England. Um, it's, it's a, I call it a light revision of the revised Standard Version. Uh, all of these and those are out. Um, the, it's, if you have, it, it reads well, it's dignified in its, the way that it, it communicates. And it also retains uh, theological uh, words, things like justification, redemption, terms that might be explained or rendered uh, explicitly. It retains some of those theological terms because even in the New Testament time, those words were starting to become uh, technical, technical words. And so the benefit of the, of the ESV is if you have people who are trying to communicate with previous generations, and I mean previous generations long gone that are, exist only in writing, the ESV will help maintain a, a, a connection, maintain a, a linguistic association with uh, older, older language and older uh, works. So that's a benefit with the ESV. The NIV, it, um, it still is the best translation for a general English audience. But what I mean by that is you can take the NIV, you can go to Brisbane, Australia, you can go to Bombay, India, you can go to Malaysia, you can go to Scotland. It doesn't matter. People will understand the new international version because it uses, for the most part, it uses non-colloquial colloquial language, a language that is generally understandable. It, it, it does, has a lot of um, literal renderings. What I mean by that, it, it interprets a lot of figures of speech. And to some people, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, they put on their sad face, they lose these beautiful figures of speech, but that's what the New American Standard Bible for is it retains the formal language so that you can kind of follow along with uh, the, the, uh, the themes and even retains a lot of the figures of speech that don't necessarily translate to English. So that's with the ESV, NASB, and the NIV. Uh, should I go on to the New King James Version? Uh, no, I think we talked about that last week. Uh, you said it was good because it showed the footnotes for the modern translations. Um, uh, but I wanted to, so just before we have Q&A, uh, so in your estimation, uh, which, uh, well, in your estimation, what do you think of ESV? Is it accurate enough to use for serious study? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, it really is. They do use a similar text base as the Revised Standard Version, even in the Old Testament. There are some questions about the Old Testament um, using uh, a, a slightly different text base than the traditional Masoretic text. Um, I especially, you especially see this in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, where it talks about he divided the nations according to the sons of, in the ESV, it says the sons of God. So does the RSV. And the um, NASB, NIV, NKJV, which all use the traditional Masoretic text, it says he distributed the nations according to the sons of Israel. Well, it's, a rather, it's a different, different meaning there. Um, but the, revised, the English Standard Version Base its for the most part it based its Old Testament on not just the Masoretic text, which was the kind of the, the formal base, but it went and said, okay, let's look at the um, let's look at the Greek Septuagint, which was produced before the New Testament era. Let's take a look at uh, Latin editions and Syriac translations and see if we can get to an underlying Hebrew or a prior Hebrew that we have. Uh, to the 8th or 9th century Masoretic text. So they put, the, they usually include those in the main text itself. All the translations will footnote that. They'll say, like the NASB will say, so, say uh, some, trans, some ancient versions say sons of God versus sons of Israel. So, but the ESV, I would say, is a good, uh, a good literal translation. So uh, what, yeah. what is the difference between the new revised standard version and the ESV? That's a great question. So the uh, NRS, I would have to say that the English standard version and the NRS, the are like close cousins or sister translations where you have Judah who remained faithful to 
to the Lord and, and Israel, well, decided to follow its own ways. <laughs> no, um, NRSV, uh, the New Revised Standard Version, it was the successor to the Revised Standard Version, produced again by the National Council of Churches of Christ. Um, but it was intended for liturgical purposes. In other words, it was supposed to preach from the pulpit, and it truly does have a much better euphony. It does have, uh, it, it reads really well out loud, uh, but so does the ESV. The ESV is a little more uh, better for those who are familiar with the King James Version, a little bit better. Uh, the NRSV, though, um, it's, it's one drawback, it's one flaw, because it's trying to be inclusive, because it, it's, it's, its audience is a mixed audience of women and, women and, and men, um, it was deliberately intended to be inclusive in its language. And I'm not just saying where it says brothers, it says brothers and sisters, it would actually rephrase or rephrase sentences or change pronouns from you to the, or from he to she to them in order to be more inclusive in that, in that language. And even the Anglican church recognized that the NRSV tended to take a few too many liberties. So it's less precise um, with its gender language than the ESV. Um, the NRSV is typically used in academic settings, but I have this to say about the new revised standard version. There is a new update um, to it as well, the 2020 update that it, I don't know much about its nature yet. It's supposedly produced in conjunction with the Society of Biblical Literature, so it's supposed to be more literal. Um, but there, that that's where the state of affairs for the New Revised Standard Version is right now. And um, so the first attempt at giving a modern English translation uh, in addition to the King James was in the 19th century, and that was the Revised Standard? So the first attempt, actually, to put uh, the King James language into modern English, is that what you're asking? Yeah, in the 19th century, I'm saying. What was the translation called? I forgot now. Well, let's see. There's actually multiple attempts, but the attempts that were produced by committee uh, and generally recognized, you had the Revised Version of the 1880s, you had the American Standard Version, and then the Revised Standard Version from 1946 New Testament, 1952 Old Testament. So what is the difference? That's the confusing thing to some. Why do they call the one in the 19th century the, the Revised Standard? And why do they call the one in the 1940s and 50s the Revised Standard? How oh. do we know the difference? So no, the, the one in the 1880s is called the Revised Version, just playing RV. Oh, and then the Revised the, Version. Okay. And it's usually prefaced with English Revised Version. Okay. And then that I then get. the 1946, it was the Revised Standard Version. So the ESV tries to keep a lot of the same uh, language in some ways of the familiarity of the King James Version, but I think it's 85% similar to the new Revised Standard Version. That's that's about right. Yeah, it's, it's maybe even just a little bit closer, um, but... Nonetheless, language is still updated. It will preach well from any pulpit. But they try to keep some of the main poet, poetic phrases of the King James, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. All right, so we're going to open the floor. We got about 20 minutes. Uh, anybody questions even about the Passion Translation, the King James only uh, controversy, or ESV, NASB? I mean, we could talk about the Holman Study Bible. We could talk about... Mm -hmm the Christian standard study. I mean, there's so many other good translations, but just wanted to keep it to some of the main ones. So any questions or comments, please. Hey, Joe. Go ahead. Hey, Al. Alan, Alan Deb Warner. Uh, wasn't able to hear last week, so I'd love to hear just the thumbnail sketch of the passion, but what about New Living? So the New Living Translation was produced in, uh, as a successor to the Living Bible. The Living Bible was a, a, an attempt by Kenneth Taylor to kind of paraphrase the American Standard Version so that his kids couldn't understand it when he was reading the Bible to them at night. Uh, but the success of it 
extended beyond his the his family's house and um, Billy Graham eventually picked up on it and he promoted it at, in his crusades and then the living bible just took off from there and um, Kenneth Taylor's son Mark wanted to make the living bible more uh, accessible to uh, seminaries college professors pastors and he knew that it needed a lot of revision in order to get it to that point. And so he had a, a huge team of evangelical scholars and professors work together to produce uh, the, the New Living Translation. That was in 96 that was published. And they knew that they didn't want to just update the Living Bible. So they wanted to do a thorough revision. And the 1996 edition was kind of the first attempt and so they wanted to go the full way of a, of a dynamic equivalent translation that would be acceptable by scholars. So they, in 2004, they published a second edition and that kind of became their, their, their dynamic equivalent gold standard. For anybody who wanted a word for word gold standard, the NLT tends to be that. Okay, now in terms of the Passion and the New King James, the next table, the global table, I'm going to interview Matthew again. And we're going to dive into the passion and the again revisit a little bit of the King James only uh, controversy from different angles from last week. So you you could all stay on. This is so important. I can't overstate how important it is that the most important book we'll ever have in our lifetime. We have to understand it. It would be like you being a mechanic and not understanding the tools yeah. that you have to fix a car and. and you know, I really believe strongly that we have to have a working knowledge. If we're not scholars uh, in terms of all this, that's fine. But we have to have a working knowledge of the purpose of the translations. Anybody else a comment, question? I've got a question about the ampli Amplified. Yeah. Amplified and also the mirror. Oh, the mirror. Ha, ha yes. So the Amplified Bible was a product of the Lockman Foundation, same as the New American Standard Bible. It was actually the uh, produced prior to the New American Standard Bible in a couple of, of volumes. It was it took off immediately. It was really successful. But there, the I I feel that the American Stand, not the American, so the Amplified version, which they've updated a couple of times, it it's great and it's terrible, and. It, it's great when it's no, people know how to use it, and it's terrible when it gets hor horribly misabused. Um, there are uh, the different form, types of brackets in the amplified version, which kind of uh, indicate how the amplifications ought to be used. Because of the tendency to go through the amplified version, you'll see a lot of these glosses inside of parentheses. And what people will try to do is force all of these lexical glosses into that context in as saying, oh, all these meanings must somehow fit here in this context. Um, and when, when in reality, that's the, the glosses are there to kind of inform the flavor of the word used in that context, not necessarily to read all of them into that context. And so the Amplify can serve a good purpose uh, if it's used appropriately, but if it's, if, if people start to cherry pick glosses to fit um, as they as they deem, then it gets abused. Wow. As far as, far as the mirror translation is concerned, I don't believe it's a complete translation. And it was um, it mostly it's almost what I consider a Marcionitic Bible. The reason why is because it cuts out um, uh, it, it, it tends to take a universalistic view of, of Christianity, uh, focusing mostly on Paul's letters and focusing on uh, grace exclusive of responsibility almost. I haven't looked at the mirror translation for a long while. Uh, it's been almost, I think, 10 years since I last looked at what they had produced, but I, it's a horribly biased uh, translation. And I would never recommend the mirror translation. Okay. Anybody else? Question, comment? Thank you. Uh, the relationship to uh, the different versions, where do you see the source of the role? 
Pardon, Eugene, could you repeat that last sentence? Yes, in relationship to the, the different versions and strong concordance. Where do you see the strong concordance playing a role in all of this? I'm sorry, your, your microphone is cut in or out. Is it possible you can lift a little closer to your mouth? Yeah, well, Gene, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? A little okay. better. Try one more time. Sure. I said in relationship to the translations and the Strong's Concordance, where do you see the Strong's Concordance playing a role in all of this? Okay, Strong's Concordance in relation to the the tr different translations. So the Strong's Concordance was uh, an attempt to index all the vocabulary of the, of the Bible, Hebrew and Old, uh, Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament, and to list them in alphabetical order so that it would be an easy reference for the King James Version. The Strong's Concordance was based on the King James Version. There are New American Standard uh, Strong's equivalents there's an NIV, Goodrich and Kohlenberger produced an NIV concordance, but they are translation specific. Um, as far as use of concordances, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. Uh, the use of the concordance with the translations, it's uh, great when it's used appropriately, you, but you need to use it according to the tools built into it. For instance, the Strong's for the King James or the New American Standard and the Gerdrick Kohlenberger concordance for the NIV, they will indicate um, not just the English word, but they'll tell you what Hebrew word it is, it is with the index number on the, on the side. And you would want to look up that index number in the back and find all the renderings of, of that index number, because the index number gives you a Hebrew or a Greek word. And you want to follow the Greek or the Hebrew and not just the English. And so it's a great tool when you use it to its full extent, um, when you use it to look up the original language and trace the original vocabulary. Um, it's uh, on the surface, on it, or as a very basic use, it's great for recalling verses that you're trying to remember. It's like, oh, that was that word, what's that word? Okay, so there's that word, where's that verse? There's that verse. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. That's what most people tend to use in Strong's Accordance for, um, but it's ideal when it's used for its language study. Yeah, and to a point, the Strong's is outdated. That was good 30 years ago, but now there's so many Bible apps and software uh, because the Strong's doesn't note every word, although Spira Zodiades has a concordance that notes every word, but you got Logos, you got Bible Hub, you got so many where you just press one verse, or I mean, one word, gives you the Greek, the Hebrew, the lexicon, everything, whereas the Strong's, it's, it doesn't give you every word. And uh, yeah. The, the, the thing with uh, like Bible Hub, for example, they actually use Strong's index to get you the Greek and Hebrew. Um, so it's, it's not that the Strong's is done away with, but it's kind of mutated into a, a, a electronic form where it kind of hides behind, behind the, the programming. Yeah, uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, anybody else, questions, comments? Question about an online tool. Uh, question about what? An online tool. An online tool? Yeah, Which one? The, the best that I use now, I'm not up to date, maybe Matthew is, but the one that has the most libraries and the most tools is Logos. I'm not sure if there are others that have superseded that, um, but Logos is amazing. I mean, you don't even need to know the original Hebrew and Greek, and you could do great exegesis and even know how to pronounce Greek words, Hebrew words, by pressing a button, um, and it gives you... If you were to exegete scripture using Logos, you would probably learn Hebrew and Greek the right way. If you did that a few hours every day in another year or two, you'd know a lot of the key words in Hebrew and Greek. It's just amazing. There is uh, another piece of software. It's not as sophisticated uh, as the Logos. And Logos really is the gold standard. It's the best one available. Um, but there's another one online that is free. Um, it's much simpler, it's much more basic. It's called eSword. Um, uh, brother up in Washington, I believe, 
designed this thing and it's gotten its own community of support and produces all sorts of modules available for it. You'd have to purchase some of the, uh, the licensed translations, but it's a, a great tool for, um, for Windows, Mac, even iOS. Um, and if you need to need a Bible study software on the go, it works really well. And it doesn't cost you a penny besides uh, the individual translations that you purchase. Logos, usually you have to purchase as a package and uh, usually it costs a bit more upfront. Great, great questions. Yeah, the sword is a great one. That's, I forgot all about that. I've been using Bible Hub, but sword is great. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Come on, it's not often you have someone with this kind of knowledge about re, uh, all this research with translations. Yeah, I got a question. What translation would you recommend for someone who is new to the church or a new believer as like a welcome gift? Um, I know I prefer the ESV. Sometimes it could be intimidating, um, just as how it reads. That is a great question, Michael. Um, and, it, and it's good to keep in mind that the, each of these translations have a, a particular audience in mind. The NIV for a more general one, um, ESV for those a little bit more churched. Um, it was intended to serve, serve the church. But I would say for a new, a new believer, just coming in unchurched, no background whatsoever, um, maybe he's coming as, as a complete secularist or whatever, I would recommend the New Living Translation or even the Good News Bible, but I'd, I'd probably put the New Living Translation ahead of that, of the Good News Bible, and because those are just, if you need to, to read through it, it's extremely readable. Um, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't put anything in technical language, so it doesn't uh, give any cause for people to stumble as they're reading through. Um, yeah, the New Living Translation would be my ideal for a new, new believer. Thank you. The funniest translation, and even though this may sound, this could come off the wrong way because uh, it could sound like I'm mocking another group, but, oh man, I love this translation. If you look up, I think it's the Hawaiian translation. Oh, the Hawaiian pigeon one, yeah. Oh my Lord, it's like, instead of God's only son, God's only boy, uh, I mean, it's just so, oh man, it, it just gives you an appreciation of the ways people communicate across the world. And it you could understand it because it's partially English, but the way their phraseology is, is, oh man, it's me and uh, somebody else in the church read the Hawaiian translation. It's, it's great. Oh. I don't, I don't think I could get away with uh, handing it to someone who's entrenched in, let's say, um someone from, from yale for that matter if they're oh no yale. not for serious study but it's just interesting that that's all i could say um yeah if thought, certain sexual proclivities i'll just leave it at that they'll say uh if a man is itchy with another man you know uh it's just the way they communicate um it's just fascinating love it i i love these different languages well, we oh, got have a, a minutes. Anybody have one got a series called the Cotton Patch Church? Bro, what was your question? Yeah, so I mean, I think this question is gonna show how unscholarly I am. <laughs> but um, my favorite translation, by far, by a lot, is the message. Is there anything wrong with me? <laughs> I, I can totally sympathize. Um, Eugene H. Peterson produced this thing. Actually, he started this thing back in the uh, early 80s uh, during the Carter years when they had an economic crisis with the, you know fuel lines and everything. And people were all thinking, well, we ought to buy, get, buy guns and protect ourselves. And he's like, come on, guys, I just preached to you the whole grace message and the providence of God. He's a Presbyterian. And he's like, you guys have got to get this message. And he try, even tried uh, teaching his church Greek in order to get the message. And they, that didn't take off very far. Um, but he intended, he just decided to paraphrase, he, even though he's a, a knowledgeable in Greek and Hebrew, he decided to paraphrase uh, 
uh, the Greek and Hebrew in a way that would be just absorbed more more easily by his uh, by his his church. It is a paraphrase. It is a it, and sometime quite often actually it'll put things in there that have no warrant or precedent because he's trying to use illustrations that uh, demonstrate what the text is going for. Um, it's I would never use it for study. I would never use it for discipleship, but for someone who maybe is already familiar with biblical language and wants a fresh take on it, um, I would use it in that case. And so, yeah, even even uh, Eugene Peterson, he never preached from the message. He, he actually preached from the Revised Standard Version, but he, he himself would never recommend the message as being preached from the pulpit. If he were alive today, he would say he would say that, and he did say that when he was alive. Thanks. Any, anybody else? We got one more question before we transition. Or comment. John, John, John Hammer, he has a, a question in the chat. It says, when we see a lot of one theological camp get behind a translation. translation, do you think it's with the translators? For instance, it seems to be a lot of Reformed theologians endorsing the ESV. Yeah, well, you do have a lot of Reformed uh, folks behind the ESV, but you also have a few Charismatics um, or I guess, I don't know if you could call him a, a charismatic or quasi-charismatic, uh, Wayne Grudem. Uh, he was behind the, the ESV. Um, there is concern for theological bias in any translation, uh, but you'll want to look at who was actually behind the translations themselves. And you'll find uh, that the the what I mean by behind the actual translators and where their theological backgrounds are coming from, not just the people who are promoting the translation, but the people who are behind the actual production of it. And you'll find uh, that in all these translations that we talked about, with the exception of the single, the sole translations, that is the uh, sole translators, like the message or the, uh, or the passion translation or something like that, usually they are very eclectic in the kind of people who uh, participate. You have, um, you have a mixed bag of folks behind the ESV. Uh, they're, not just, uh, they're not just reformed, even though it's, it's, you have a lot of reformed people promoting it. Um, same goes with the NIV. Um, you've got a lot of uh, just a, a real mixed bag, a very eclectic group of people. Yeah. There's a lot of great scholarship in the NIV, ESV. Man, it's amazing how eclectic it is. I will say this for the ESV. I think one of the reasons why the, there's a lot of reformed folks behind the ESV is because some of the technical language, like I talked about, justification, redemption, um, uh, propitiation, these words are perpetuated in the curriculum of the reformed, reformed schools. So they are tend to be more elaborated in those schools. So it becomes a useful tool to, for their education, for their discipleship. Whereas I don't think as many folks in the charismatic movement care so much to, to retain these, these particular theological terms. And so let's say the NIV or the New Living Translation seem to fit uh, our, our method of discipleship better. Okay. Um... We're going to transition to the global table, and we're going to talk about the Passion Translation, New King James and King James only, as well as a few other things. Uh, and I also want to make you uh, aware that October 10th at 730, and we'll mention this again, uh, we're going to have one of my favorite New Testament scholars in the world, Craig Keener, is going to be interviewed by uh, Al Warner and Vince Thomas and myself will all be part of a panel, U.S. Cal, 7.30 at night, Sunday, October 10th, and we're going to deal with the issue of hermeneutics. How do you interpret the word? Uh, it's as, as important to know how to interpret the word is to have the right translation or to not to read, you know, read the Bible. So you could have biblical literacy, but be illiterate in understanding how to apply it. 
So Craig and uh, N.T. Wright are two of my favorite, most esteemed uh, theologians in the whole world, especially the focus on New Testament. So keep that in mind, October 10th, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. All right, so Vince, can you transition to the next table? And I'm Absolutely. going to excuse myself for two minutes. So, hey, Bishop, uh, could you, could you, hit, could you oh. hit the uh, stream for me? Perfect. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all for joining us again for another U.S. Cal Global Table. Um, I'm Vince Thomas, and uh, we are just getting ready to have a dynamic dialogue. One thing that I want to let everyone know, uh, as we, if you've been around for a while, you know I'm going to ask you on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube uh, to just let us know where you're tuning in from. It just gives us an idea of just how far this conversation is uh, being held. And also, I wanted to avail your attention to the USCal.us website. Um, where we host um, different content that we've discussed, all of our global tables, as well as the virtual bridge summit. If you weren't a part of that, you definitely want to be a part of that. It's on the uscal.us website, along with a host of other resources. So, uh, so grateful that you all have joined us today and uh, looking forward to the dynamic discussion. So, Bishop Joe, I'm going to turn it back over to you now. Okay. As already mentioned um, in the last table, there is a October 10th video roundtable. We try to do at least two to four a year from US Cal. And uh, this year, it's going to be the esteemed New Testament scholar, Greg Craig Keener. He's the author of perhaps the greatest commentary on the book of Acts in the history of the church. Um, the background uh, cultural background bible which is amazing and, and so many books i mean he just sent me about five or six books uh from baker and he's sending me a whole bunch more you know we become friends through the prophetic standard statement which he signed on to so we became friends through that um and uh yeah amazing so october 10th 7 30 p.m put it in your calendar next u.s cal uh, se semi minor uh, mini conference, so to, so to speak. Okay, so today we have an amazing discussion that you're going to be in for a treat. Uh, my friend Michael Barron, who put together just an amazing tool for your library. I, I would suggest all of you get this book that he's going to show you in a minute. Uh, as preachers and communicators of the Word of God, whether in the church place or the marketplace, it's vital that you understand the greatest book ever given to humankind, and that's the Bible. And there are various translations. Some are terrible. Some are, you know, okay. And some are very good. Some are great for reading narrative. Some are great for word for word, serious study. Um, and today we're going to focus on two of the most controversial right now. And if we have time, we'll get into some other things. But uh, Matthew, give us a quick snapshot, like a one-minute snapshot of, of, you know, your biblical journey. Okay. Oh, boy, my biblical journey starts when I was young. I remember, I think I was about, what, six years old, and I started pulling out uh, a Bible and trying to transcribe it word for word uh, with as many English letters as I knew at the time. And but I didn't get very far, but right there I had the makings of a scribe. Um, and you remember what Jesus said about uh, about scribes who enter the kingdom of heaven are like uh, those who pull out of the treasure stores things both old and new. Um, and that's one of the the joys of going through Bible translations. It really is like like pulling out treasures both old and new. Um, I love, I love the old, old, old translations like um, Tyndale's and King James Version, um, but I value so highly having the Bible in a language that people can understand, and I love different renderings of it that add, uh, and I wouldn't say necessarily more flavor, but it's almost like taking a diamond and turning it around so the different facets finally show and gleam, like, oh, now I'm starting to get the whole picture. 
Um, so, so, yeah. Yeah, this book um, was a compilation of a lot of interaction with many theologians, scholars. It's a shame you didn't get credit for it at a master's or a PhD level, but can you hold up the book? Uh, I highly recommend this book. I've read most of it. Can you tell us the thesis of this book? Why did you write it? And what is the content? Sure. The book's titled The Best Bible? Question mark. Uh, because that's the question people ask me. As, uh, as I was going along about six years ago, I was at a small group with a friend of mine who said, man, Matt, I got people asking me what the best Bible is. What do you recommend? I was like, hmm, well, I have some thoughts off the top of my head, but those are just presuppositions and prejudices. So I'll tell you what, I'll write a reference work. And it was supposed to be much thinner and it ended up being a lot thicker. Uh, this is about a 600 page book that of my journey discovering uh, Bible translations. And the summary of it is it, it takes you to th into three sections. The first section gives you the kind of the overview of the translation process and the production process of a translation. Uh, the middle section is a, a short brief review of where we got our English Bible translations starting from John Wycliffe back in the 1300s, late 1300s to the King James Version of the 1611. And then the last section is a detailed uh, assessment and re review of 12 of the most popular uh, translations today. And I found in my, in my discoveries, I found that it's about 40 or so English Bible translations currently in print, and only a handful of them are really bad ones. The majority of them tend to be very good. Um, and, but it's just that they're de designed, and, uh, designed for specific audiences or specific applications. Okay, so let's just jump right into this. Um, there is, a, you know, a popular translation amongst charismatics today. A lot of charismatics are referencing it. Uh, no, no squabble with someone wanting to write a translation on their own. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the intent is good. I'm sure they're great people. And they may be even value in reading the translation in, in certain ways. But what is your honest scholarly opinion of the Passion Bible or Passion Translation of the Bible? What are the strengths, weaknesses? What is its use? So the Passion Translation produced by Brian Simmons, um, Brother Brian, his intent was to get the heart of God, to transfer the heart of God. Uh, into modern English readers. He wanted to carry the passion of the scripture uh, into the hearts of believers. That was his intent. Um, and well, his, he, I don't think he quite uh, reached that goal. And again, not that I have a problem with a single translator translation, not that I have a problem with, um, you know, this is, this is a, he doesn't really have a committee or anything like that. That's not a problem. What is the problem is there are certain biases that creep in, and without uh, uh, reviewers to address them, they tend to perpetuate throughout the translation. One of the one, so the biases are one thing that I really find objectionable with the Passion translation, and it's mostly seen. You can really see it clearly, actually, in the his rendering of the Song of Solomon. Um, he takes an interpretation that the Song of Solomon is an allegorical book detail, the, describing the relationship between God and his church. Um, and he takes that interpretation and, and imposes that on the rendering. So if there were any other possible interpretation, let's say like it was a, I, I view it as, sure, it can be an allegory, but I view it as also an erotic love poem uh, between a lover and his love, beloved. And he will, uh, Brian Simmons will not allow that kind of re rendering to creep through because he has a bias against the nature of that that reading and so um it's not just my opinion about the text but also people who have, are experienced in bible translation uh with other translations we think we mentioned craig keener um let's see is he yeah let's see if he's here describing it um there we go. No, not Craig Cleaner, Cleaner but uh, he would have opinions on it, that's for sure. But you have uh, other other translators like Tremper Longman, 
Douglas Moo, Craig Blomberg, Daryl Bach, um, they all reject the trans uh, passion translation precisely because not just the biases, but also his assumptions about language and how language works. Uh, one goes so far as to say, um, despite some of the wonderful passion and turns of phrase, there's also enough problems with it that it probably should have had a Surgeon General's warning on it about its potential hazards. That's Craig Blomberg. Oh. <laughs> One of the uh, assumptions about the, the, uh, the language that Brian Simmons carries into his Passion Translation is that the New Testament has a, a strong Aramaic basis, uh, and that's so much so that, that the Aramaic uh, renderings of the New Testament carry on more meaning than are available in the, in the Greek Bibles, uh, the Greek New Testament. And, it's, and it's, unfortunately, the assumption is uh, misinformed by, because it's the only Aramaic renderings we have are not really Aramaic. They're a later cognate language called Syriac. Um, and that Syriac trend, uh, versions of the New Testament are itself, are themselves based on the Greek New Testament. So he's trying to bring out the passion of the New Testament through a later version that's dependent upon the the Greek New Testament, which is the basis of all of our uh, New Testaments. And he, it, it's, it's reading back into the text, things that may not necessarily, or actually are not, not there to begin with. So uh, is there any connection with the Lamb, Lambs the Bible, the one that people use with the, uh, they believe that that's, it's almost like a cult they believe that that is the true translation based on the Aramaic. Is there any connection with the Lambs of Bible? Uh, how to say this? Uh, Simmons is quick to denounce Lambs and denounce Lambs movement. Um, he doesn't doesn't accept that view himself. Uh, he, but even yet, yeah, even then, he depends on Aramaic translations by those who are unqualified as translators. Um, I'm trying to recall some of their names, but they're, they're all self-published translators of, of uh, Syriac. He does, he says, he purports, he avers that his new, his, the New Testament is translated from the Greek uh, New Testament, but his, what he puts into the text are insights that he's gathered from Syriac. Um, and he doesn't just leave them in the footnotes. He actually inserts them and puts them into the, to the uh, um, main text. One example is where Jesus is at the, uh, at the cross. And Brian Timmons brings this point up quite often. Uh, Jesus is on the cross and he says, it is finished. That's what we're familiar with our, with our other English translations. Brian Simmons back translates the Greek word, it is finished, takes it into Hebrew and goes through his strong dictionary, finding uh, a possible association with the word bride. And so he's saying, hey, what you put into the text, um, it's like, here, here it is. it's not as finished, it's my bride. Um, so Jesus is making the point, supposedly at the cross, that it's referring to, to why he was on the cross, but not necessarily that it doesn't, it doesn't carry the text the meaning of the text across, the meaning of the, of the original Greek. All right. Well, let's move on from the passion. Uh, uh, I mean, well, let me just ask one question. From your opinion, and this is the last question about the, the passion, is there any, in your opinion, would there be any profit in reading the passion for serious study, or is it just good for, I mean, what, what would you, is there any profit in, in the passion? So I would, never, I would never recommend it for serious study. It has right. some great devotional comments. The, the biggest problem is there are inaccuracies. I found inaccuracies within even his footnotes. So it becomes a challenge. You'd have to be a professional to know which of his footnotes are worthy of application and which are to be discarded. And so it's a rather hit and miss. That's why I, I could never even recommend the Passion Translation, not even for its footnotes. All right, moving on. Uh... You know, I, I remember getting taught and reading books that we we're supposed to go by the majority text, the King James Version, 
came from the Antiochian tradition, which is the most accurate, oldest. The modern translations have come from the Alexandrian tradition, which was a corrupt tradition. Uh, and uh, there are some attempts at scholarship to uh, downplay the veracity of the modern translations from the quote unquote King James only movement. Um, and um, so first, what um, give us a snapshot of the, what you think of the King James version. And, you know, people don't understand that it's a translation from another translation, the Bishop's Bible, and then yeah, the Geneva Bible, of course. Give us a snapshot of the King James Version and what you think of the King James only controversy. What is your position on that? So the King James Version was kind of the ideal translation at its time. It was produced by uh, a strong committee of people who were, were able linguists in, it, in their day. And um, as Brother Matera said, the King James Version was a really a revision, a revision of the Bishop's Bible of, of a few years, 40 years earlier, which itself was based largely on the influence of the Geneva Bible, which I, I personally believe the Geneva Bible is probably even better than the King James Version. The King James Version was produced for the Anglican Church by Anglicans, um, mostly Reformed. Uh, they, they all held to uh, the Anglican creeds. Um, and one of the reasons why the King James Version only movement exists is because the, the King James Version was produced uh, just before the great, great Reformed creeds like the Westminster Confession of Faith, which itself makes references to passages that are found only in the King James Version. And so there's a huge movement to defend the King James Version uh, because of, of its support for, uh, because of its apparent support within the Westminster Confession of Faith, which, by the way, I great love the Westminster Confession of Faith. I think it's a good creed, but I don't think that's an adequate justification for the King James Version only. But the King James Version, it it's it kind of its history. It was, it has to go, we have to go back to 1516, with the publication of a, a little Greek New Testament, a diglot, a, a, a two language edition of the Greek New Testament. Actually, it goes back even further. So let me backtrack even there. Uh, 60 years before, you have two in major influential events. One in Germany, in Mainz, Germany, you have a little guy by the name of Johannes Gutenberg of the Gutenberg Bible fame. He invented or perfected the movable type system. That created uh, a, a process for producing Bibles much, cheap, much more cheaply and at greater distribution. At the same, same decade, in 1452, you have a little city, actually not a little city, a very big city, um, to the east called Constantinople, the former Roman uh, capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. And in 1452, the Ottoman Turks overran its walls. This is significant because the Greek community, the Greek elites, uh, and the Greek intellectuals uh, left Constantinople fled for the lives and landed in places like Venice, Italy. Um, and they brought the, the Greek scribes, Greek monastics, brought with them their Greek manuscripts, largely of the Byzantine style or the uh, Byzantine family of manuscripts. And these became the basis for new printed editions. 1516, as it is, Erasmus publishes, is the first printed Greek New Testament, which that forms the basis for Martin Luther's translation of the September Testament in 15, 1522, I believe. And then a later edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament becomes the basis for William Tyndale's 1525-1526 uh, edition of the New Testament. And these Greek New, New Testament printed editions are based on a small number of later Byzantine manuscripts. What's significant, okay, so I need to break down a, a couple of phrases when we talk about manuscripts. You have, you may have heard the term majority text. Majority text is the sum democratic vote 
of all the readings within all the existing extant manuscripts. It just so happens that the majority of these manuscripts tend to be of the Byzantine family. The Byzantine family of manuscripts uh, tend to be later because they, they, the later manuscripts as they're further north in their provenance up in the Turkey, uh, some in the, the Sinai Peninsula, um, some, it's the oldest ones that, some of the, the oldest ones of the Byzantine family we have, they go back to say the fifth century. Um, and the, it was only copies of that family of Greek manuscripts from the 12th to 14th century that were included in Erasmus's Greek New Testament, which is forms the basis for um, Tyndale, Geneva, Bishops, and the King James Version. Much later on, 400 years passed between the King James Version and the uh, American Standard Version. And you have lots of discoveries. You, the British Empire expands, uh, you have uh, adventurers and explorers and archaeologists digging in foreign parts of the of the realm, and you guys have guys digging in places like the Oxyrhynchus uh, Oxyrhynchus Valley in in Egypt or in that area. They are able to dig up very old, very ancient fragments and portions of the New Testament that some date as early back as the uh, mid to late second century. These are the earliest uh, New Testament fragments that, we've, that we all have. And as these pieces were put together and uh, there was a, a, a greater need to produce a critical edition of the New Testament text, the Greek New Testament, that predated what the, the King James Version uh, translators had to work with. And that became the basis for the English Revised Version became the basis for the American Standard Version, and all the modern editions to this day uh, were based upon earlier manuscripts uh, discoveries than were the King James Version had access to. It, the differences between, let's say, these the critical text and the Byzantine family, um, or the, I should say the critical text and the majority text, the differences may be less than 4% of the New Testament. There are some significant passages um, but Erasmus, because he was working from manuscripts and not complete ones at that, uh, he had to actually do some back translation from the Latin Vulgate into the, his Greek edition. For instance, there's certain passages at the end of Revelation that he didn't have access to. So he, he has a, we have a unique rendering, the King James Version, where it says, um, it talks about the book of life when the critical editions say, no, 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 it's not book of life. We have manuscript evidence. It says it's tree of life. So it, you know, it's a difference of a, a reference, a difference of significance there. You have also a passage in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, talks about the, uh, uh, the three witnesses. Uh, you, know, you have the, the, the blood, the water, and the spirit. You have father, son, and, and spirit. And the words father and son and the Holy Spirit there uh, are not in the original text. They were, they were added kind of as, uh, the, the story goes, that was kind of added as a bet where Erasmus didn't have them in his Greek, Greek manuscripts. And uh, his associates, his Catholic associates said, no, 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 it's gotta have this phrase. It's gotta have the three witnesses in there. It's, it's missing from your edition. It's like, okay, I'll tell you what, if you can find me a manuscript evidence in support of this reading, I'll put it in. And so they found, let's see, his, his, his edition was published in the 16th century, and they found a manuscript dated to the 16th century with those words in there, in the Greek. They said, all right, you win, I'll put it in. But there's no, no early evidence for that reading. Um, and that's kind of unique to the Tyndale King James tradition, thanks to Erasmus's Greek edition. By the way, Erasmus's Greek edition and the editions that are based upon it, of which there are about 11 or so editions, 12 to 11, uh, those are collectively called the Textus Receptus. You'll see it abbreviated as TR. You may have heard that phrase, Textus Receptus. So the King James Version only had 
a summary of how many manuscripts at its disposal for the translators, as opposed to, let's say, the New American Standard Version. Oh today. boy! Oh joy! Here, this is this is fun. So the the King James Version translators had at their disposal disposal about fourteen Greek manuscripts in the form of a, a couple printed editions. Fourteen. Compare and contrast that to our extant manuscripts. We have over 5,300, 5,300 New Testament manuscripts in part or in full. Uh, lots of them are fragments, but we have much more textual evidence for the Greek New Testament today than the King James translators ever had. Right. And so what would you say in summary to someone who purports that the King James is the only true translation? You'd have to go under, recognize first off that a lot of these uh, claims have a, an emotional attachment to them. Um, and you would kind of have to point out their presuppositions. Um, and some of those presuppositions about the King James only differ from one another. I mentioned that one of the reasons why the King James Version only movement gained strength is because the King James Version was the one that was present in 1647 when the Westminster Confession of Faith was produced. So there, there's an assumption that this is the one vernacular translation that God ordained because it's in, encapsulated or it's, it's, it's referred to in our Westminster Confession of Faith. And so there's that kind of that emotional theological attachment to a historic document. Um, that's one assumption you'd have to address. Another thing is to go in and some people uh, have an attachment to the King James Version because it sounds holy. It sounds transcendent it, because, frankly, there are words you simply cannot understand if, uh, in modern English today. You actually have to have a dictionary uh, that with historic words or obsolete words in order to understand it. And to that, you would have to take uh, King James himself and you go to the text that says you know uh, a, a trumpet if you can't understand its call it it's no no value how's that verse go here it is i would take him to the scripture and i say for indeed if the trumpet produces an indistinct sound who will prepare for battle and so you through the tongue unless you produce a clear message how will it be known what is spoken for you'll be speaking into the air first corinthians 14 8 through 9 and that's kind of one of those basic verses that you want to take a KJV only person to to say does the King James version itself match up with that for the scriptural mandate or scriptural uh, standard of of language use so what about the new King James version it cleans up the old language right uh, so yeah. is the new King James version good enough for serious study uh, it, cleans up the language it also shows the manuscript evidence so what do you think of that version i very much approve of the new king james version uh i think it is a great translation it is a static translation which means there's no committee that's perpetuating its uh its updates or anything like that um so it is kind of locked into the language of 1982 or 1984 but Nonetheless, it is probably one of the best translations to set alongside a King James Version. And I would recommend if, if people are, uh, are tied to the King James Version that they would bring a new, a new King James Version alongside so they could actually understand the words that are reading. The language is still uh, keeps the cadences, uh, keeps the rhythms of the King James Version. Um, I remember I went to a, uh, a Pentecostal church growing up. And uh, it was a translation that was recommended in place of the King James Version if you wanted to memorize scripture. Um, so I memorized a lot from the New King James Version. But I, it, objectively, I think it is a, um, it's probably the best translation to put alongside the King James Version. And it, it, it puts language in modern English. And as Brother Matera said, it footnotes all the differences in the crit between the majority text and the critical text and the sexus receptus. So you can see at a glance where the variations are. One of the primary arguments against the modern translations as opposed to the King James was that um, the 
King James Version exalts the deity of Christ more than the other translations. Mm. The second argument is, well, the church used the majority text for, you know, the first 1800 years. God smiled on that translation. That's the greatest proof. We should just use the, the King James Version because we didn't have access to the earlier trend, uh, manuscripts until the 19th century and then beginning of 20th century. So what do you say to those two arguments? Well, here's the problem with that, is that the early church had access to earlier manuscripts. Uh, so even though the majority text was available for the last, what, it, I can't even say it's 1800 years. The, the Byzantine uh, text was kind of a uh, little bit more standardized than perhaps the other uh, manuscript traditions but it only kind of stems from the, the fourth century with uh, Emperor Constantine uh, starting at that around that time. And then it take, took off from there, came to the kind of a standard model of, on which later Byzantine manuscripts were based. So different communities tended to have, um, like let's say the Alexandrian Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, um, had a text type or a family of, of manuscripts with minor variations from the Byzantine family. The Byzantine tended to, uh, to harmonize passages while the Alexandrians come, had a, a community of scholars like uh, Origen, for example, who uh, were more critical about the transmission of the text and were very, tended to be a bit more careful um, from what we can gather, it tends to be a bit more careful in its transmission, so there aren't as many additions, as, aren't as many emendations in the Alexandrian text type. Um, that's kind of a, uh, a a general a general paintbrush. Um, there's when you're talking about the the the, the discipline of textual criticism, there are innumerable number of of uh, of particulars to deal with. Um, because we have 5,300 manuscripts, we have a potential, and each manuscript is copied by hand. You try copying a letter uh, from, by hand from one piece of paper to the next, you're gonna have the kind of errors or kind of variants that you're looking at are typically very minor. You may see a difference in synonym. You may see a line accidentally repeated or a line accidentally omitted. You may see uh, a transposition of words. In one of the criticisms we talk about the earlier manuscripts is that somehow it doesn't uphold the uh, divinity of Christ so much. Well, it's not fair. You, because the, the, there's a tendency among Byzantine manuscripts to expand or amplify or harmonize the text. Well, the, and when, when it talks about uh, the divinity of Christ, it's usually a replacement of a synonym. I put in a link, by the way, in the, com in the comments, kgvparallelbible.org, that shows uh, instance by instances the kinds of differences or kinds of translatable differences uh, between the critical editions and the King James text base. Um, with 5,300 manuscripts, all hand copied as a basis of our modern translations, you're going to see variations. And you, the, vari the number of variants can, equal, can amount some, some estimates, uh, because we haven't counted them all, some of the estimates range up to about half a million variants. But that's not saying much. The reason why is that the half a million variants, only about a, a single percent of them, maybe 50,000 of them, are meaningful. That is, they can be translated. Um, in Greek New Testament, uh, word transposition doesn't mean a whole lot in the inflected language where words are determined by the, the, the use of a word in a sentence determined by the word's ending. Uh, position within a sentence is, doesn't, is not even translatable. Uh, spelling, if there's a difference in spelling, well, there was no standard orthography. There was no standard spelling. You didn't get, even, even in English, you didn't have standard spelling until Samuel Johnson made a, a, his dictionary in 1755. So, those are not really a, st a strong basis for uh, denouncing uh, earlier manuscripts. As far as the divinity of Christ, there are synonyms that are used. It's still referring to the same person. The referent is the same. Um, but you can see some of those for yourself by going to that link I posted.
And there are also instances in the later manuscripts, I'm sorry, in the later translations, where they seem to exalt the divinity of Christ better than the King James Version. That's correct. Yeah. I've noticed that many times. Um, okay, let's just jump into some of the other translations. Um, NIV, is that a good translation? I recommend the NIV. Yeah, it was produced... Uh... It was started as an evangelistic tool. It was really intended to carry the Christian message. There's a little bit of history with the NIV going back to the uh, late 50s. Um, it was started by a couple of Reformed uh, synods, in fact, uh, who and they gathered steam and gathered a bunch more um, of just conservative evangelicals um, all of the people who worked on the NIV, uh, all the translators, and even the Committee of Bible Translation, uh, signed a that they signed confession of faith that they believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord. Um, so it really is that's the kind of the if you care about biases, you care about uh, assumptions. That's their working uh, assumption. So uh, same with the NASB, same with ESV. These guys are dedicated believers in Christ. Um, but the NIV, what makes it such a great translation is that it is really produced for such a wide general English speaking audience. You could take it from Bombay, uh, India to Brisbane, Australia. You could take it to Malaysia. You could take it to Scotland. You could take it throughout North and South U S uh, Canada. It's understandable because it's non colloquial colloquial English. Some people think it's a little bit more dry because of that, but it makes it, it makes it a very readable translation wherever you go. And it's produced by uh, scholars who know their, who, who know their work, who know their, um, who are definitely qualified trans, uh, scholars and translators. The NIV is a bit more of a word for word. It's, it's what they call a kind of a, a middling translation between the, word for word the, and stop the thought. You mean the NASB? Oh, um, the NIV, no, too. It's, it's, oh, the okay. NIV tends to be, if you have uh, an extreme word-for-word -word formal, and you have an extreme dynamic equivalent thought-for-thought, uh, -thought, the NIV lands somewhere more in the middle. Okay. The NASB would be more word-for-word. -word. Uh, the ESV would tend a little bit more word-for-word. -word. Uh, the NLT, New Living Translation, would tend more towards dynamic equivalent. And dynamic equivalent would be uh, sentence. sentence by sentence. Precisely. Uh, Their the main uh, intent there is for us to understand its equivalent in English and context more than word for word formality, which many scholars prefer the word for word, but it would be wise to read the context through one of these other translations first. Yeah, I'd read that. Full meaning. Right. Okay. Why is the NIV so much easier to read? It's it's really a blessing to me. Um, I I love uh, the NIV when I'm reading something historical like the Book of Acts, the Book of Judges, First, Second Kings. Why is it so flowing? Is it better when it comes to context and narrative? Yeah, that's a. It was specifically designed to be a general reader's Bible. Um, and it uses, as I said, non-colloquial English, and it was uh, translated sentence at the sentence level, so that uh, you're carrying the ideas. Um, it, it's, it, it, there's not a single, it's not, a, not a passage there that isn't justified by the language uh, of the original, um, but it's, it's still rendered in a way that fits just generally English usage. That's why it flows so well. So the intent of the NASB, according to your book, is for discipleship. Yeah. The intent with the NIV is more for evangelism, I guess. Mm -hmm. And what was the intent for the ESV? Anything in particular? Yeah, the ESV was intended as a, as a ministry tool for the church, because the church, as it is with its tradition, with its uh, historic associations, um, the ESV, even though it comes from the Tyndale King James Version tradition, 
it is still a modern translation based upon critical edition. Um, I wouldn't say critical, but eclectic uh, editions of the Old New Testament. Um, the ESV, what's so great about it is not only does it retain the kind of the cadence and the rhythm of the KJV in a modern in modern language, but it also retains some of the more technical language in the New Testament, words like propitiation, justification, uh, sanctification, words that uh, have historic theological discussions surrounding them that tend to get lost in uh, like the NIV because the NIV is more sentence by sentence. It's, it's trying, it doesn't want to hide um, uh, si significance or hide understanding. So I think for those of us who are theologically trained, we hear the word propitiation, we make it immediately make an association. We know that that is, we know what atonement is, we know what justification is. But for someone, and, and that's what the ESV is so great because it connects us to the previous generations. Um, but for someone who's brand new to this stuff, you say the word justification, and you kind of have to explain that in the NIV would would uh, um, would give a, an interpretation of that, not necessarily a word for word. It would say uh, made made righteous, uh, made righteous in God's sight, or something like that, along those lines. Now I've heard some scholars say they wished their favorite translation is the NASB, which that's mine, that's for sure. But the fact that it wasn't enough of a seller it didn't it wasn't on the best sellers list a lot of people are recommending the esv not because it's better than the nasb but because they want more unanimity of congregational reading they want people to try to have the same bible in their churches um uh, uh and so they're they're recommending the esv even though for personal study, they prefer the NASB. So there, there's a slight nuance between the NASB, the ESV, and then the later edition of the 2020 version of the NASB. So can you uh, share the differences, the nuances between the NASB, the 2020 NASB, and the ESV? Sure. So the NASB kind of the uh, descendant of the American Standard Version, which had a reputation of being the rock of biblical, biblical honesty. Um, it, the NASB so, sought to be a very formal, formal rendering. What I mean by formal, it, it allows the forms of the Greek and the Hebrew uh, to show through through the English. So when it renders grammar, it renders the grammar consistently. When it renders vocabulary, it renders it concordantly so that the same word is repeated. It doesn't use a synonym. It, it tries not to use a synonym, even though it still sets up the con context. Uh, it tries to render English words or um, Hebrew and Greek words with uh, a single English uh, word as consistently as possible. Um, the ESV doesn't have the same compulsion because the King James Version itself was not that way. Um, so it uses the same principles when it renders uh, in, uh, Greek and Hebrew, it, you, it, it allow for a synonym here and there to make it flow with this a little bit better. The NASB uh, is kind of a family of translations. Starting back in the 60s, there was a, uh, an edition produced in 1977, which kind of became a, a standard of, uh, of, of serious study. And then it was, that was updated in 1995, where they improved uh, the English usage especially in the areas like in the Psalms and Proverbs, where they really improved the way that uh, the English was used. So to conform to modern English usage. The update got rid of the uses of these and vows, which in prior editions was used explicitly or specifically, sorry, to refer to God in prayer. There is now uh, a new update um, called the 2020. The 2020 edition um, like its 1995 predecessor, retains italics to show where the translators have added uh, words for clarity. The, the ESV in the tradition of the Revised Standard Version does not include italics. So it's, it, the NASB makes it a little bit better for a uh, more careful study. The 2020 edition also, its rendering tends to be a little bit of uh, more fluid than the 95 update, especially in the prophets, particularly in Isaiah chapter 53, where they revise the language to read much more smoothly. 
the 2020 edition also has improved um, lexical vocabulary. That is, it, it, up, it not only updates the English, it also is more precise in the renderings to be more precise with the ways that Hebrew and English, no, sorry, Hebrew and Greek were used back in the day. Um, it's a little bit of a better linguistic tool for that, for that purpose. There is um, an additional uh, edition, the Legacy Standard Bible, which was uh, promoted by John MacArthur, um, Grace to You Ministries. And the Legacy Standard Bible is another NASB Bible, the copyrights owned by Lockman Foundation. And it purports to be a very formal rendering, more formal than the 95 update. Um, and so it becomes I, what I would imagine to be a, an ideal text for word, for word studies, ideal for uh, tracing themes throughout the Old New Testaments, because it's, it's just much more concordant um, and even more formal than the, the 2020 edition. So it keeps some of the good updates of the 2020 version, but is a little more word for word accurate. That's right. Uh, now, some may be confused with <clears throat> the ESV is almost, what, 90% similar to the uh, new revised standard version. And let's not get into the history of the revised or new revised, but it's very similar to the new revised standard version, yet you claim it's very similar to the King James Version. So how could the both be true? Can you explain okay. that? Okay. So to be, to be, uh, to clarify, the English Standard Version is much more akin to its predecessor, the Revised Standard Version, which itself was preceded by the American Standard Version, which was itself preceded by the Revised Version, which was the update to the King James uh, Version. And because of its, uh, its legacy, it retains uh, some of the flow and the, the cadence and the rhythm of the King James Version. The English Standard Version's sister or cousin is the new Revised Standard Version, which was also uh, an update of the Revised Standard Version. So the RSV kind of forms the base for the English Standard Version and the new Revised Standard Version. And I, I put them at two different directions because that's kind of where they, they, they're, they've gone. Where the ESV um, is a light revision of the Revised Standard Version. Um, the English Standard Version, as, as Brother Matera said, it's between 90 to, to 85 to 90 percent the same as the Revised Standard Version, just some, some uh, slight revisions here, update language there. The new Revised Standard Version is, um, the NRSV is a kind of more of a radical, um, radical direction from the RSV. Both the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, and the New Revised Standard Version are were produced by the National Council of Churches of Christ, which is an ecumenical body, uh, an ecumenical, ecumenical association of churches. But the NRSV tends to find a place in um, colleges. If you go to a secular college and you go to a, a religions class, they recommend you purchase the New Revised Standard Version. The NRSV um, was produced by people who did not make a formal commitment, uh, a for formal uh, commitment to evangelical faith, even though there were evangelicals on the team, but it's an ecumenical Bible for everyone from Orthodox to Roman Catholic to, um, to evangelical. The NRSV is characterized by uh, euphony. It, it preaches well. It was intended for litur liturgy, um, but it also has, tends to be a little too loose in its use of, use of gender language. It's uh, gender inclusive almost to the, actually gender inclusive to the lack of gender precision. And so even though it's very inclusive, it allows it, every, all of its hearers to kind of, um, to, it, it, for the most part, it's, it's pretty accurate, but except for where you have that, the, the gender language. Okay, and the ESV, is similar to the King James in what way? So it's similar to the King James in that it's not it's so much that its textual basis is the same. Its textual basis is, is different. Keeping in mind that the textual basis is only less than, it's like 3.3.5% different from the King James version. Um, 
but it's similar because it retains some of the traditional language. I'm not talking about the these and thous, but I'm I'm not talking about old, outdated English that um, that nobody knows the meanings of nowadays because nobody uses that language. I'm talking about the theological terms, the terms that were started to become specific, uh, or terms that were started to become technical even as the New Testament was being written. Words like justification, sanctification, uh, propitiation, atonement, uh, words that um, are useful in maintaining the dialogue with historic uh, discussions, Christian discussions. Um, so for those who grew up with the King James Version, if they, um, they would be at home with the English Standard Version, uh, those who grew up with the RSV would be very much at home with the English Standard Version. And uh, I feel that it's, it's, um, the ESV is, has one advantage over the New King James Version. I would put those on par. But the ESV has a, a, a continuing body of, of translators, uh, a group of a, a committee that maintains the translation and uh, ensures that it has resources to support it. Whereas the, King, the New King James Version does not have the same amount of, of support. You don't find as many resources in the New King James Version as you will in the English Standard Version. Okay, so we're gonna deal with some Q&A. We got about 10 minutes left. Uh, Dino Rosado asked a question, express your thoughts on a new English translation of the Septuagint. Oh, yeah, I've got the, the nets. The new English translation of the Septuagint is um, a great translation produced in the last couple decades. Um, it, there used to be kind of the gold standard of English translations of the Septuagint, is it, but a little background. Septuagint is, the, is a translation of the Hebrew Bible that was produced before uh, the New Testament, before Christ came on the scene, uh, before Jesus and his incarnation came on the scene, I should say. Um, the Septuagint was kind of the, the authoritative text for the Jewish diaspora, the, those who were Jews who were scattered throughout the Alexander's successive uh, kingdom states uh, from Egypt to uh, Antioch. And it became kind of the, the, the Bible for the Greek-speaking church. Um, and so you have, in the 1840s, I think it was, uh, Lancelot Brenton uh, produced a translation of the Septuagint as opposed to the underlying Hebrew text, so as a, as a reference. And that became the standard. And we didn't really have modern translations of that ancient version until you came, the New English translation of the Septuagint came along. The New English translation of the Septuagint is kind of a it rendered along the similar lines as the New Revised Standard Version. They complement each other really well, um, but it's I think a little bit more scholarly even, uh, even though both were produced by uh, scholars. I think the NETS is really valuable for those who want to uh, dig into the history of the Greek Old Testament. Okay, well, that's great. Any other questions, comments? You have Someone to unmute asked. yourself. Unmute yourself or raise your hand so we know who it is. I see there's a question in the comments. Any thoughts on the New Living Translation? I have lots of thoughts on the New Living Translation. Um, and they are generally good thoughts. Uh, New Living Translation is a successor of the Living Bible, but Unlike the Living Bible, which, is, which was a, produced by a, a single uh, Christian brother, Kenneth Taylor, uh, Kenneth Taylor's son, Mark, wanted to make certain that the, um, that the Living Bible had a broader audience amongst, uh, amongst scholars and Bible professors and seminaries. So he actually approached the professors, scholars, and Bible seminarians, and he said, hey, uh, we want to have a translation that kind of embodies the, the the dynamic equivalent sentence by sentence uh, thought for thought model. Uh, and we want it to be become the, 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 the kind of the gold standard of thought for thought dynamic equivalence translations, but we want it to be done well. So he asked uh, a large group, I think over a hundred uh, scholars to contribute. Um, and the NLT was the product of uh, this collaboration 
And it is, again, it's, a, it's very much a thought for thought, uh, uh, sentence by sentence translation. And which was why it reads so well, it reads so easily. I, I think it's great for devotions. I think it's great, especially for new believers who are coming in and need a, a Bible that won't intimidate them. Uh, it's not dumbed down language by any means, um, but it, it is language that is written for uh, a general American audience and wow. Canadians too. So ESV would be better if we're preaching in North America, but NIV would be better if we went international to an English speaking audience to preach, would you say? Um, I think that's fair. ES, the ESV would be good in Great Britain and the US and Canada. I don't know how well it would serve, or in Australia, I don't know how well it would serve in India, except I do know that the ESV is the only conservative evangelical translation that I'm aware of that is actually being used by Indian Catholics. Uh, there is an edition of the ESV Catholic edition that is being used amongst uh, Indians today. Uh, it's what surprised me. Um, but the NIV would be ideal for even uh, where the ESV would have technical theological language. The NIV would be ideal for even a broader audience, those who are less who have less familiarity with the Bible already, less familiarity with Christian theology. Two other questions. Any thoughts on the source New Testament? No, I've never looked into the source. I don't have an opinion on that one at this time, although I probably will after this discussion. What about uh, what translation is good for, you know, the apostolic prophetic churches? You know, does it make a difference in your opinion? Apostolic prophetic churches. Well, because uh, the apostolic prophetic has a lot of, uh, of Pentecostal history, and a lot of Pentecostal churches rely a lot on the King James Version. I would say the New King James Version would be a, a very useful asset in that regard. Um, if you're an apostle uh, or a prophet, I would highly recommend a New American Standard Bible. And the reason why is for apostles need to study and they need to have a good uh, study Bible. And prophets need to be able to link the themes and, uh, and tie in the uh, tie in word associations that the New American Standard makes uh, better available than most uh, sentence for sentence or dynamic equivalent translations. What about the ESV when it comes to those word associations? How does it compare to NASB? Uh, the NASB is more concordant, although the ESV is made stri uh, striven to be uh, more concordant in most more recent updates. The NASB beats the ESV as far as concordancy word for word, hands down. Well, in, describe to everyone what you mean by concordant. Not everybody understands your terms. Sure. When I speak of a formal translation, a formal translation is one that allows the Greek and Hebrew grammatical forms to come through into English, and uh, the NASB consistently renders those uh, more so than other translations. Um, when I speak of concordancy, I'm talking about vocabulary that is rendered with the same English word uh, consistently throughout a translation. Uh, the English Standard Version uh, doesn't do that as often or as frequently as the New American Standard Bible because the English Standard Version is a little bit more concerned with the general context of the words that are rendered there. Um, the NASB becomes a better tool for precision. I wouldn't say, and I, I want to make a, a distinction between accuracy and precision. Precision means you're allowing, um, you're allowing consistency of translation you're allowing a consistency of rendering the same word for word. Um, for instance, let's say you get the word charis. Uh, the NASB would be more consistent in rendering that word as grace, where the ESV might, be, uh, might recognize the context. Instead of consistently translating charis as grace, it would translate the Greek word charis as grace or gift or something along those lines, depending upon what the context demands. So in a sense, the ESV is a little bit more accurate while the NASB would be more precise. So that's why the NASB I recommend for discipline study, the ESV for, um, for as a, a, a tool ideal for use in the church, for those who are already familiar with some theological language, some theological background, 
and the NIV, which I, it's another accurate translation, but not near as precise, which is ideal for, uh, for a general audience. NLT, I, I would say the NLT also is an accurate translation, except it is not as precise because it is, um, it, it's again, very much dynamic, very much uh, sentence by sentence. It's supposed to uh, make sense to a, 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 a general audience. Uh, and so that precision, that word for word precision and that grammatical consistency and that concordancy where words are translated uh, word for word uh, consistently across the board, uh, the NLT doesn't have, have that. Okay, we're almost out of time. Maybe one or two other questions. I was reading off of the chat, but I don't see any others. Anybody else? Uh, hey, Bishop Joe, this is Derek Ott. Yes, Derek. Hey, um, I apologize if someone's already asked this. I did have to step away from the call for about 10 minutes. But regarding the NLT, um, would that be recommended for children as well? Like, you know, I'm talking preteens. Um. The NLT could be recommended for children. I think that there's another translation that might be even more ideal. That would be the New International Readers version, uh, which was specifically designed and targeted towards children. Um, its language is much more basic. It uses a smaller set of vocabulary than the NLT does. Um, and for younger readers, uh, the New, Revi New International Re uh, Readers version, what I think would be better than the New Living Translation. I think once you, get into the teens, you. once you get into the teens, I think take uh, transition them on to the new living translation. Okay, one more question or comment before we end it. Okay, so do me a favor, Matt. Matt, do you just hold your book up again? We want to highly recommend this book. It's called the best bible question mark so it's the best bible because that's the question that got asked all the time by matthew j Barron. that's me and this is available on amazon um this is also available on my website at fontespress.com i can post those in the in the comments in just a moment yeah well you did a splendid job uh quite amazing all the work you've put into and i'm just excited over this book it's a great tool I've been a fan of reading on, uh, you know, all the translations for many, many years, and you put it all together better than anybody I've seen. And you updated it because other books I've read didn't include some of the latest translations like the ESV, uh, Legacy Bible and, and 2020. So you've updated it. And you, man, it's just an amazing tool. Even if you're not going to read the whole book, I recommend you get the book for future reference when you have questions. Next week, we're going to have Leif Hetland again. This time, we're going to deal with the issue of Islam, long-term projections, friend or foe. We'll probably talk about what's going on in Afghanistan as well. Uh, and uh, in two weeks, we're going to have um, Fred Market talking about the implications of what happened in, in Afghanistan from a, a geopolitical perspective and the prospect of speeding up World War III um, because of the collapse of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the, the, rise, the rise of the Taliban. So what are the implications for world peace in the next few years? So we're going to deal with that in two weeks. So next week, uh, we're, going to have, uh, we're going to continue this amazing dialogue. Vince, can you transition us to a close now? I mean, I don't, I don't know how to follow today up. This was absolutely outstanding. Again, this teaching will be available if you're watching on YouTube. Um, we have a playlist that's available for you if you're watching on Facebook. Uh, save this link um, as well as for those who are on Zoom. Uh, you can go to uscal.us and as soon as the conclusion of this meeting occurs, this video will be available. I've already sent it out to my church. I encourage you all to do the same for your networks and those you have influence over. So uh, we thank you so much for being here today and look forward to seeing you next time. And maybe what we could do is put the link for Matthew's book on our USCAL website too. Highly recommend the book. So try to connect with Matthew. 
Well, really appreciate all of you. Um, thanks for being a part of this every week. It's profound. We have incredible discussions and highlight of my week is being with all of you. So let's just take a minute to say goodbye. This has been sponsored by USCAL. You can go to uscal.us for the past global tables. If you want to join USCAL, I would highly encourage you. If you lead a movement or a network in the workplace or church place, join this community. Uh, certain things that we do will be invitation only, like that uh, roundtable. Uh, okay. So let's uh, let's all say goodbye to, to each other. Take a few minutes now. Good to see all of you. Good to see Apostle Ron. God bless you all. Thank you, Richard. Thank, Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it. Stand up, Owen, Carol. God bless everybody. Dennis. I awesome. Rick. Rick Minard. Rick. Callahan, God bless you. Uh, Melvin Green. Thanks, my friend. George Runyon, Al Warner. I didn't know Al was still in the faith. I'm happy yes. he's here today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Another day. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for all that you do. It's so informative. I never, I never, never heard such great revelation. That young man, Matthew, is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, you're welcome to get in touch with him if you want to have him share with your networks, your church, or yes, contact him. Uh, Matthew, put your email on there too, okay? Please, please do that for me. And of course, you guys could text me for his. Yeah, I already did. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm getting a royalty of ninety percent of all book sales from Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, declare, I declare that moving from this time forward. <laughs> oh awesome. bishop love you Huma. thank you so much bishop awesome table matt awesome teaching awesome research uh such a blessing yes all right god bless god bless hey, thank you good to see all of you man bishop uh, blessings it was truly a blessing today truly a blessing Raul, yeah. it's, it's, it's good to know this generation is still very much uh desiring to give, to receive and give information of such caliber. Matthew, you are truly a shining star. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank yeah. you. Ditto. Bishop, it was great. Let me know when we can connect. I wanna I bring you up today with the DR project. So let me know when, when you have time for that. I, I can't connect with someone who reads the message Bible. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love that message. I love that. I love I, it. Baby. Come on now, you're just fellowship, brother. <laughs> that's funny let, uh, let, let me know bishop okay definitely yeah we'll we'll just text me that's all i'm not going to remember just text me when we can connect okay all right, all right. let me know your schedule next week okay all right, all right. good you. to see ken fish reg uh jackie uh not everybody's uh linden is there Praise God. You go. All right. Well, we're going to sign off. Pestapur is there. Rick Lyon. We're going to sign off till next week. God bless you all. Love you all. Stay safe. Man, be blessed. Thanks, Thank you. Bishop. Likewise. Bless you. All right. Take care.